So I would say first of mindset you need to have is of a steward. Okay. And so for me, one of the things that I ask the Lord on the regular for is Lord, help me to keep a light grip on whatever you give me so that if you give me something, I can enjoy it, but I'm never clinging onto it so tightly that when you go to move it somewhere else that I am refusing to let go. Because the moment I start holding on to what he's given me and not allowing it to be used for his purposes, why would I expect him to continue blessing me financially? This is the Fit Investor Podcast, where we talk about how to live a more holistic life of being fit, not only financially, but physically and faithfully. We'll be joined by experts in all these areas to share their experiences and actionable and practical tips so that you can be a fit investor too. So now let's join our hosts, Kale Delaney, Wesley Whitehead, and Brenna Carls. All right, ladies and gentlemen. So this is actually our first episode here, the Fit Investor Podcast. And today we are going to interview our famous co-host here, Mr. Wesley Whitehead, or the bearded man, as we like to call him. So Wesley and I really, we've been, we've known each other and been friends for gosh, almost 20 plus years now. Pretty much. Yeah. So we had gone to college together. We'll let Wes tell a little bit more about the story, but we started off as bitter enemies and became the best of friends. And uh, so we're going to be interviewing Wes because he really embodies all three topics that this podcast focus on, the financial, the physical, and the faithful fitness. And so we're going to hear a lot more about what he does, but just briefly, Wes, why don't you start us off? Tell us a little bit about your background, who you are, where you're from, why do you have a beard, etc. <laughs> Excellent. So I'll start out with, I'll say I had the beard to hide my face. So there you go. <laughs> And a little bit about my background, I'll go back to what Kale said. So we've been friends for 20 plus years, started out as gym rivals, which is pretty funny. And then once one of us spotted the other one doing something, we realized that we weren't as bad as we thought we were. So we became friends and then eventually roommates after college and then have been friends ever since. So that was a good time, a lot of good memories. So my background, I went to University of Miami with Kale. I studied finance and marketing, and I've always wanted to be an entrepreneur, but didn't really know what to do with that or how to make that an income stream. So I got out of college, did what most people do, just took a corporate job, worked for a few years in Miami for a company that dealt with primarily with Latin America. And in the process, I actually met my wife, which is pretty cool. And we've been married for 15 years. Worked in Miami for a few years and actually our company was bought by a competitor. And so I was in, in line to be laid off and in the process. I found a job out in California, awarded the layoff, which was great. Took the severance package, moved out there for a few years, did some investment work at Fisher Investments actually. And then after a little bit of time out there, I quit that and moved to North Carolina. And then eventually opened up this pet resort that I run. And I've been doing that for 10 years. This is actually our 10th year of running it. And had a lot of ups and downs, a lot of crazy stories. Learned a lot, have a lot more to learn. And I'm grateful every day that God has blessed me with the ability to provide for my family. And from home, mostly doing it. Awesome. Got five kids. You're married. And you have your own business, which you touched on also, which is a uh, pet resort, not just any type of pet resort. I think it's more of a luxury pet resort. Yeah, it's it, we wanted to be different. We The idea came years ago, obviously, and we didn't like the idea of the concept of your typical, what you imagine when you hear of a dog hotel or imagine a kennel, chain link, cages, concrete floors, loud smelly about my house <laughs> yeah well, that's my house with five kids we didn't want that so yeah so we just started researching i started researching across the country the best pet resorts is i think my first google term and reading articles written in magazines local magazines about up and coming pet hospitality businesses that are changing the industry and i took notes on what i liked what i didn't like what i think what i thought we could afford to do 
what I thought our local demographic could afford to pay. And so created a business plan. And like you said, Kale, it's a high-end pet hotel, uh, grooming salon, and dog daycare center. And we also have a dog park attached to it, a five-acre dog park. But the philosophy behind it was we wanted a pet hotel that the owners dropping off would feel comfortable if they had to stay there. It's not cheap to stay with us. And these clients of ours are not skimping on their vacation accommodations. And since the dogs are parts of their family, basically, we wanted them to feel comfortable leaving them behind and know that they were being taken care of as if they were in their home. And what's the name of your business and where is it located? So the name of the business is Blessed Oasis Pet Resort. And you can Google us. We've got a web page, obviously Facebook and social media accounts. And it's located in Fayetteville, North Carolina, which is about an hour north of South Carolina border off I-95. Now, did you choose that location strategically or was it because that's where you were living and your family was living at the time? Yeah, actually, the, it's an interesting story. So the business is co-owned by my wife and I, a third, my parents, a third, and an outside investor, a third. And so my parents had some extra land and my business partners had some extra cash. And we all came together and put our know-how resources and land together. And so we actually lucked out because the property that my parents had, they weren't using is, has been built up all around with neighborhoods and shopping centers, movie theaters. So it's a great location and. Let's just say that today we wouldn't be able to find a spot like that if we were in the market for it. Awesome. And I'm just thinking here because I'm in the hospitality industry as well, but for people, but I would imagine that there's a lot of similarities between the industries. What do you find to be, because you had mentioned when owners come to drop off their pets. You want them to feel comfortable that it's someplace that they would be comfortable staying, right? So what do you do or what do you offer that exhibits that? that I would sense? say the biggest thing we offer that exhibits that would be transparency. And that's a word thrown around a lot lately, but we do it literally. We have live cameras in all the rooms, the hallways, the lobby, the grooming salon, the play yards everywhere. And those cameras are broadcasting 24 seven. They're not behind a paywall. Anybody can go to our website and view them. Our competitors think we're nuts for doing that. In fact, I was just at an industry conference in Galveston this week, actually. And when I mentioned to other pet industry owners, our camera system, that it's not even behind a paywall that our competitors could view the cameras, which they do. They all thought I was nuts. But for us, it's been huge because when a client knows that they can check in whenever they feel like it from their phone to see how their dog is doing or their cat, and they know that if anything happened, it would be recorded and could be pulled up for review. They know that the quality of care they're receiving is going to be second to none. And we have to fulfill that because you can't do anything that you wouldn't do if the client was standing right there. And that makes a lot of pet industry owners nervous because sometimes what on camera can be misleading, especially if there's an internet connection issue and it looks choppy. You may not see the smooth movement of a door opening. It may look like the door was slammed or busted open by a staff member, for example. If you're taking a dog down the hallway and they have a leash on, it could appear like you're dragging the dog, for example, across their will, which we're not. But the cameras, they don't lie. And clients love that. So that's probably the biggest thing that, that we do that gives them peace of mind that allows them to feel like, okay, I can stay here because I know it's being done. No, I think that's awesome. Is there any other amenity or thing that you think you provide that sets you apart from your competitors? I would say that we invested heavily in the quality of the building and we thought about everything for dog comfort. So from our ceiling tiles that are sound absorbing so that the place doesn't smell, doesn't sound loud to our central vacuum system, which is built into the walls with no drains. The fact that the place is quiet when you walk in and it smells fresh. In fact, we have some clients who work at the local hospital and they say that our facility smells cleaner than the hospital does. 
Because in a hospital, you smell a lot of chemicals and things like that. What we use is specific to our industry and it smells great. So I think those are the big things and clients recognize that and they'll pay a premium for it. So what I'm hearing is besides the camera idea, which I think is excellent, I'm hearing first impressions, right? Which I mean, in any hospitality business and frankly, in most businesses in general, first impressions are going to be crucial. It sounds like you put a lot of research and a lot of investment into creating a great first impression for your clients. That's, so that, that's a, it's a very good point. And to add to that, so true. A couple of years ago, when I was planning a price increase to keep up with labor costs and whatnot, I wanted to make sure that the first impression that the clients, when they walked in, received would help tamper their response to the prices. I actually sim- just simply ordered a custom built stone marble foyer or lobby table. And I just started getting flower service. So we had a large bouquet delivered every week of live flowers and it just livens up the whole lobby. It's beautiful. It changes with seasons. And uh, yeah, that right there has had a huge impact also because clients now walk in and they're like, wow, like this place looks like a hotel lobby. So you're absolutely right. That's great. It's another great idea. So what drew you to that industry? Because it- this is just because I know, obviously I've known you for a while, so I know a little bit more of the background, but you had previously had some other business ideas prior to this, right? Yes. Um, so maybe you can touch on that briefly, what those were, what happened and what, why you ended up in the so, resort. That's an interesting story. So basically, like I said before, I've always had an entrepreneurial desire or an itch and I never really could pin down what I wanted to do. I had several ideas, who knows if they would have ever worked but they all lacked funding. They were all large ideas that required significant amounts of money, which I didn't have. This actually worked because of, I would say the sovereignty of God. So basically my brother was in town visiting for the holidays and he was at the time working a contracting job where he would work 30 days overseas and then 30 days back home. And so when he was back home for those 30 days, him and his wife and his kids would travel a lot to spend time together since he was off work. And they had two dogs and he was basically complaining about the small fortune he was paying to board his dogs. And he was just on the side just saying, you know what, like if you want a business idea, you should open up a pet hotel because those places charge an arm and a leg. (laughs) And the idea just seemed kind of just bounced off of our heads while we were listening to it. Nothing really serious. But actually my parents were like, you know what, we have some land. This actually might be a good idea. So they asked me at the time, hey, would you mind doing some market research for us? So I did that, came back and I said, yeah, it looks like our market could support this and it could be pretty lucrative if you do it right. And they said, okay, would you maybe make us a business plan? And I'm like, okay, that's fine. (laughs) Made a business plan for them. And when I presented it to them, they were like, okay, would you help us run it? And at the time I actually had a job offer out in Houston. And with actually Fidelity Investments, and I was like, man, I don't know, like I want this job out there, it has health insurance, working for yourself, you have no insurance and you make no money at first. But they convinced me to give it a try and I figured why not? At the time, I only had one one child and so I decided to do that with them. And uh, so we started working on, on, on the design of the place and getting an architect involved in site development and the cost pretty much got beyond what we had cumulatively saved. And so we were like, we need an outside, outside funding to help us bridge this gap. In fact, we were missing $190,000 of the project. It was a total budget of 650,000 that we had gotten to, and we were missing 200 and the banks wouldn't touch us because they were like, you don't have any experience in the industry. Go ahead and open up whatever you can and come back to us in a few years. We'll give you some money when you don't need it. I was like, okay, excellent. (laughs) It just so happened that my, my dad had a buddy at work who had been following the progress of this whole business venture for about a year, year and a half, and happened to ask my dad one day, hey, like, how's the project coming? And my dad was like, we're shy some money, so we're just trying to find some banks that will, that will talk to us. And he was like, well, how much are you missing? What's the need? And my dad was like, oh, don't worry, it's a lot of money. Because my dad was like, in his mind, thinking, this is way too much money. He doesn't know what he's asking. But he kept pressing the issue. So my dad, basically, to close the so the discussion was like, okay, $192,000 and 15, 192 and 15. 
And to his surprise, he was like, you know what? Let me talk to my wife. Maybe we can get a meeting. So my dad called me from work. I said, hey, we might have an investor. Can you prepare one of your investment prospectuses for them? The meetings would be in two days. So I said, okay. So we put something together and had a meeting with them and went over the financials, the business plan, the progress drawings, where we were, the funding gap. And they were interested. They were on board. So within a matter of a week, we had an operating agreement drafted with them claiming a third ownership. And they wired us the money the same day that we signed the documents. And that gave us the green light to tell the contractor to go ahead and start with his work. And so we, this all happened in June of 2013. And we had already, we had already, uh, done the site development and had the drawings done. So we were ready to go. Permit was already pulled. We paid for the permit, but we were just waiting for the funding to, to tell the contractor to start. So he started in June and we were open December of 2013. So within seven months. Wow. It's a very interesting story. And again, I just kind of just thinking of parallels and, and things like that with the industry that I'm in. So you took on, or rather your parents, you on as a partner in the beginning, and then you guys took on a third partner as well. Was there any kind of like vetting process with taking them on as an investor, or it was already an established enough of a personal relationship with your family that the trust was already there, or was there anything that's, extra that was done? That's a good question. So I, first of all, I would say in all honesty, we probably weren't experienced enough back then to do proper vetting. Today, it would be a much different process if I were to do that again, but we were blessed with the fact that they were good friends already with my parents, with my dad. And that actually, that overcame the trust issues, which was excellent. And then to add to that, the reason why they were interested in a, in an unproven business with people who didn't have experience running it was the fact that they were spending a small fortune themselves with what soon became a competitor of ours once we opened, which was a pet hotel about 25 minutes away, closer to where they live. And they were spending a lot of money out there. So they knew what the demand was like. They knew how busy the pet resort was. They knew how hard it was to get in, how when you called, you could almost never get a spot unless you booked a month or so in advance. So they already personally believed in the business models. And it just, through God's providence, it just worked out where they were put in contact with people who wanted to open one. Yeah. No, it's awesome that it all worked out. Looking back now, though, for our audience, what would you, are there any, do you have any suggestions on if somebody is looking on taking on a partner, what they should do, how they should approach it? I would say, first of all, when you have your operating agreement drafted by the business attorney, they will advise you that, hey, we're not working on behalf of any individual. We're on behalf of the entity. We recommend you get your own personal attorney to make sure your interests are being looked after. None of us did that. We all trusted each other. And I have a great relationship with the partners that were my dad's friends. So they're excellent people. But looking back, all of us agree that we should have gotten our own private attorney just to make sure that each, the document was drafted for our benefit because we each have individual and different needs. So I'd recommend that for sure. And this is probably another discussion for another day, but I, w- I would actually recommend against going into business with family. It has been a rocky ride, which I guess is the norm because it wouldn't be a proverb if it wasn't that way, just because it's very complex to make business decisions that may contradict the personal views of someone who's related to you and then keep that as a business decision and not have it carry over into Thanksgiving or birthdays <laughs> or just weekend visits. Right. So that'd be my advice. So get a good attorney and if at all possible, avoid hip business with family. Yeah, those are, I think those are both great tips. Interesting because uh, again, coming from the real estate side of things, partnerships are extremely common and a lot of people, uh, including myself, I have a couple of partnerships, but I'm exploring more bigger ones and 
it is a scary process because especially if it's somebody that you don't know, right? At least on your end, there was some established relationships and things of that nature. But if it's somebody you don't know, yeah, you're having to have a bit of trust or a lot of trust really in getting into a partnership with somebody, especially if there's large sums of money involved or things like that. And yeah, if it is family or close friends, I think it's very easy to trust that nobody's going to try to harm the other party. But like you touched on, oftentimes that can backfire because it is very difficult to separate the business from the family or friendship or whatever it may be. So I think that's a great tip on getting a personal attorney, making sure that having an operating agreement, making sure it's drafted for everybody's individual best interests and that everybody's in agreement on things. And real estate in particular, one thing that's of crucial importance is talking about exit strategy when you're in with a partner, unlike a business of yours where, and I may be wrong, but I would imagine it's something that's the intent is perhaps legacy business, right? Something that perhaps your one of your kids, multiple of your kids could take over and run, or maybe the plan is someday to sell it. I don't know. But with real estate, it's often looking at the exit strategy, which may be relatively short-lived. It may be a three to five year time, time frame that you're looking to sell or maybe 10 years or 20 years or something. So having those established exit plans discussed on the front end so that when it does come that time, or if there's an, an emergency event that a partner, for whatever reason, may need to get out, that there's a, a, a method established for being able to buy that partner out or have an exit or something like that. And that's a very good point. In fact, that's something that I also wish I had done better is you're absolutely right. You may, you make a business and you intend for it to go on for 15, 20 years, maybe pass on to your kids or whatnot. But one of the things that we did not have that we're actually doing better now in our new business that we're working on starting is having a, a very clear exit strategy for all the partners involved so that you, like you said, in case of an emergency, or if they just don't want to move forward anymore as a group, they can easily be bought out, that it's an equitable transaction. Yeah, I agree. I wish I had done that. And then also to say something else you, 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 on what you mentioned, there's definitely a trade-off with going into business with family and maybe even friends to some degree. When you go into business with family, in my experience, you pro is that, like you said, you don't have to worry about them necessarily stabbing you in the back. It's not foolproof, but someone who you know very well, whether they're blood or a longtime friend, they're less likely to stab you in the back than a stranger, 100%. But the trade off is you are now jeopardizing that personal that relationship. relationship. Right. You're jeopardizing it. It's never going to be the same. It just isn't. So it's basically about risk reward. How much risk are you willing to mitigate by going into business with a good friend or a family yeah. member in exchange for that relationship? Yeah, absolutely. Now, is your wife involved in the business with you also? She is. So my wife, so we're a member managed LC and my wife and I are member managers. The other four. So the two couples are just members. So my wife and I are responsible legally for all the data decisions. We have a management team that runs it for us in North Carolina. And like I said, we work out of the house remotely to run the company. What my wife does is she handles all payroll for us. She handles the memberships for our dog park and she handles basically HR, all the employee paperwork and files onboarding process. So she's involved in that, but I would say she's part-time. A lot of the processes we have for her, we have over time through efficiency, made a lot of them, they don't take a lot of time. So maybe once a week, she'll have to be up in the office for a couple hours. And then once a pay period, an extra day in the office, and then once a month, an extra day in the office. So again, it's a part-time job. If I had to guess, she's probably working 25 hours a week on the business, whereas I do it full-time. Okay. So what, for our listeners, part of the goal for this podcast is, and I think a lot of our listeners are going to be people who are looking to become entre entrepreneurs or early on in their stages in their entrepreneurship. And myself being a relatively new entrepreneur, 
one of the things that is probably one of the harder things to understand before you get into, especially owning your own business and being full-time in that, is what life looks like as a business owner versus working for the corporate world or in a W-2 job. So can you just give us a little bit of insight? Like, what does your day look like? Like, how do you keep structure and routine in, in your day as a business owner? And you're asking how I do it now versus how I did it in the past? <laughs> I assume how you're doing it now is probably better. So let's hear that and okay. how that contrasts. So I will start with now and then I'll go back in time because it, it, it all changes. It changes through the life cycle of our business. So now I'm very blessed to have a, a very flexible schedule. So I have my tasks. So I'm, I do all the marketing for the business, strategic planning. I do our pricing strategies. I pick our products. I, of course, do budgeting. I let departments know how much money they have to spend on payroll and things like that. So because of that, none of those things tie me to a desk at a particular time of day, apart from the occasional Zoom meeting with my staff. So I have great I have tremendous flexibility now. I can go on field trips with the kids for school. I can take the day off and go to the beach if I feel like it with the family. I can, right now I'm renovating my landscaping so I can go outside and figure out what I want to do there and not really worry about anything. So it is a challenge to stay on task when you have that flexibility because you don't have the structure where, okay, every day at eight o'clock, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to work until noon and take a 30 minute lunch break and then get back to work until five or six or whatever. So it's a challenge because there are times when the days fly by and I realize, okay, I'm a little behind on my emails or text messages and get caught up. So it's a challenge, but I much prefer this than the way it used to be. Now, this is a dramatic change. When I first started the business, I was working literally 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., 12 hours a day, seven days a week. My kids at the time would live at work, so they would go to so they would go to school, and then I'd go to work, and then I'd take them to school from work, go back to work, pick them up from school, bring them back to work, and they would stay at work with me until 7 o'clock at night. So it was rough, and it took a while before we started hiring employees, and I could have one day off a week, but it was a weekday only. Because weekends, we couldn't trust with employees because that was when we actually paid our bills. Then eventually, I started having one weekend day off and eventually weekends off. So it took a long time. So I would say the biggest challenge right now is just trying to make structure when you have this freedom. It does take discipline to do it. And there are some days I'm it's better than others. But I do remind myself that if I don't stay disciplined, that I'm that I may lose this privilege, meaning that Things may get out of hand and I may have to put my nose to the grind on a fixed schedule to fix things. And so I'm trying to maintain my freedom. Yeah. So it sounds like this was definitely a process, but you built it through the use of hiring a team really to make this not a hundred percent, but a relatively passive business at this point for you. Is that accurate? Yes. I technically today. I could make it 100% passive by just hiring somebody to be the business manager. And then I would just lose their salary out of my income and I could totally step back. The problem is that I still want to grow the business and there's no need for me to do that. Maybe if I want to retire one day, I can, but it's almost passive. It could be, but I'm not yet willing to give up that extra income to make it passive. And touched on a raw nerve for me, and this may end up being an offline discussion between us, but so I, I'm at that point where one of the beauties of real estate and in particular, the short-term rental industry that I'm a part of is that you can very quickly build yourself a business that gives you that flexibility that you're talking about. The challenge where I am currently in my business is that I have this time and flexibility and I can do everything I need to and maintain that flexibility, but do I really want to? Is my time best spent doing other things? And so is it better for me to take that bit of income hit to hire, like what's popular again in the, in my industry is hire virtual assistants 
to take on a lot of the everyday tasks. And so that's something that I'm evaluating and going through in my head right now is nice. Do I want to take that bit of income hit to hire a virtual assistant so that I can get out of a lot of these day-to-day things and make it even more passive than it currently is? Or do I continue doing these things and keeping that income? So it is a, for me, it's a mental, like a lot of things, it's all about mindset. It's a mental hurdle, right? Yeah. You build that income and then you, the thought of stepping it back a notch now, it uh, it hurts, right? Sure. Because not only are you giving up income, but you're giving up control where things may be done the way you wouldn't want them done. And by the time you find out about it, it might be a very expensive mistake. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's hard letting go of things, especially depending on your personality. But yeah, if you are, I come from a management background, right? I'm used to being in control of the processes. Part of the irony though is, and I guess it's an irony in general in life, you hear the cliches, the mechanics car is always broken, right? As a manager, I had to delegate running multi-million dollar construction projects. I had to delegate and towards the end of my career doing that, I had learned to delegate a lot. And those were actually the most successful years that I had in my career. However, again, now in my old business, trying to apply those same principles is very difficult. Yeah. Yeah, it's just one of those things that I think comes naturally. That's a good point. So for someone who's looking to get started in the pet resort or pet hospitality industry, do you have any tips or any advice or resources that they could or should look to get started? I would say the first thing is I would say differentiate yourself from your competitors. When we started this in 2013, the pet boarding industry was a lot like the hotel industry was before Hilton began buying up hotels and making them all standardized. Everywhere you went across the country, it was a different mom and pop basic hotel. You had different soaps, different shampoos, different towels, different service levels. So you just had to be the best mom and pop you had and you would do well. The industry was very profitable, and so it's attracted a lot of corporate investment. And so now there's Pet Paradise, which is a chain, which when we opened ours, there were maybe like eight locations. They were all in Florida. Now Pet Paradise has, I don't know, like over 100 locations, and they're all across the United States. There's there's a place called Pet Suites, which is a corporate brand that they've got thousands of locations across the country and the world. So they're like, they're coming in there, but they're basically doing market research, picking a city with a certain demographic, moving in and trying to dominate. So it's getting more competitive and the way you differentiate yourself is going to be key. So I would say, make sure that where you live is, or where you want to do it is underserved, but not so attractive that it'll attract corporate investors. There, this is your first one. The second thing I would say is do it as a partnership. Unless you've just got tons of cash, find some people who you want to go in business with. It does make people money. Do your market research, make a good business plan so you can demonstrate that it makes money. And then find people who are interested in it and do it together. Don't be afraid to bring in investors. A lot of times people are like, I don't want investors because I don't want to share the profits or I don't want to deal with the headache of accountability. Trust me, some of the most successful people I know have their first business was a partnership. Several people put their money together and they did a successful, like for my neighbor, for example, he owned several bars because he partnered with bartenders who he had the finances, they had the expertise. So I would say, look at a partnership. Don't do it in market where there's a corporate competitor or where one might come. Yeah, that's my two biggest advice. No, it's awesome. I think those are great. And again, I keep going back and forth between the parallels because the more I listen to it, the more I see how many parallels there are between the real estate and short-term rental industry and pet hospitality. They really do go hand in hand with a lot of these things. Those are great tips. So I do want to jump into our next, our next area, our next topic here. As you know, in this, this podcast, we like to talk about a more holistic approach to life. So not just the finances, but also being physically fit and faith why don't we talk about physical fitness? So we had, I think you had touched on at the beginning that we had met and been our, our arch nemesis. We were 
we were at the gym, right? That's how we met, I think, more or less, and how we got to know each other. So what do you do to stay physically active at this stage in your life? So I used to be a gym rat with you, Kale, and uh, did that for um, quite a number of years. I started working out seriously in college, and I was never the largest guy, definitely, but I was, my goal was to be very strong. And so I was, and enjoyed that for several years. But uh, lately, I stopped doing that. And, and the reason why is because I've taken up jujitsu. And jujitsu for me has been, at first, I didn't like it. I did it reluctantly. And I made myself stick to it because I hated it. I hated being crushed. I hated being choked or not being able to breathe or being in pain. It's uh, wonderful. Yeah. yeah, it's exactly. In fact, yesterday I was in the shower. And I noticed I'm getting cauliflower ear in my left oh, ear. <laughs> so I'm like, there it goes. So I started doing jujitsu, hated it, but I was like, I'm going to stick with it. And so I did it for about a year and then COVID shut the gym down. And I was like, yes, not I have an excuse not to go anymore. And then the gym opened back up again after COVID. And then soon after I ended up moving. So I didn't go back again. So I started going again, moving down here to Florida. And I like jujitsu now. I actually enjoy it because I liked the physical challenge, especially going up against guys who are bigger and stronger. I like how it's, if you just, if you focus on technique, you have an advantage. Obviously two guys with similar technique. If one guy is at the gym every day, bulking up, he'll have the advantage, right? But if you up against somebody who's bigger than you and you have technique, hands down, you're going to, you're going to play with them. So I started doing jujitsu down here and I was working out and I just didn't have time to do both. I just didn't. And so I had to pick one. And so I chose to to stick with jujitsu for now. And so I'm actually at the point where I'm probably gonna start working out again, just because now I can do both. I feel physically able to do both. But in the beginning, especially starting jujitsu when I'm almost 40, it was a big toll on the body. A lot of pain every day, a lot of pain in the morning. But anyways, yeah, so my, my fitness routine right now is jujitsu. I love it for the cardio. A six-minute grappling round is like sprinting for six minutes. It's something that it's hard to replicate outside of martial arts. And so I enjoy that and do that. And I got my kids in it. My, my oldest daughter is 11. She's doing it and she's really good. And then my six-year-old son is in it and he's just, he's still just starting out. So he's learning. But if I stick him with it and he doesn't quit, he should be very good by the time he's an adult. So that's my, that's my thing right now. See how that goes. Yeah. Brazilian jiu-jitsu is, I think it's becoming more and more popular these days. I mean, I had done a very brief stint of it and uh, yeah, number one, it's a very uncomfortable process. (laughs) And number two, like you had mentioned, trying to work out or lift weights every day while then trying to do jujitsu jitsu for me it was just very it's very difficult because i'd be so sore from the gym and then i'd go try to do this jujitsu at night and it just made everything that much more painful yes and then the next day at the gym you're in even more pain yes <laughs> it's like no it's this, a snowball effect or, and i didn't want to for me it was i didn't want to give up on the gym and so yes. i i gave up on jujitsu. But I would like to get started in something like that, whether it's that or boxing or something. But And I would recommend, if you're young, I would recommend that's when you should try to do stuff like this. Because I noticed that in, in BJ, the guys in the class who are like jacked and good at grap- good grapplers are all in their 20s. Right. Because you just ha- your body is just designed for that. You've got tons of testosterone. Your joints are so flexible. You heal so fast these guys can go work out they can squat they can do squats and then come straight to the gym do grappling and then go for a run these guys are insane so 100 percent. i think yeah if you're going to do more than one you need to start when you're younger now there are some guys in the gym who are jacked who are in their late 40s early 50s but these guys have been doing bjj and weightlifting for years so they've got like a system now where their body's adapted to it and I think one of the things with Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, probably most martial arts in general, is that as you advance and become more of an expert in it, it's less 
of a physical exertion. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because yeah, like you were saying, you do one of these rolling sessions and it's like you're dying after a yes. couple minutes. But then if you do or you or a session or you watch the the instructor or do they call them senseis or what no. Yeah, just the instructor. You watch them and they're as calm and collected as can be while they're holding someone in a chokehold. <laughs> That's a hundred percent the higher belts barely break a sweat unless they're rolling with another higher belt. And even then they're not muscling it. Even the muscle guys are all technique. So when they try something that doesn't work, they just try something else. Or as when you're a lower belt, like me, you're like, whatever works, let me just get out of this position. And so you end up straining yourself and hurting yourself. Yeah. And that's what I found is that again, being a weightlifter, uh, again, I'm not biggest guy, but I'm relatively strong for my size. And so just like you say, you kind of default to what your strength is at that point. So that wears you out even more because yes. now I'm using, I'm just using pure muscle to try to break these holds or, yes. or whatever maneuvers. And that's extremely exhausting. Yes. But once you learn those techniques and you see how to use the other person's leverage, that it's not about strength, frankly, it's utilizing the other person's strength or the other person's weight advantage even to make it a disadvantage for them. Exactly. And BJJ is a lot of joint manipulation. It doesn't matter how strong your muscles are. We all have similar joints. And yeah, hundred percent. I would say like in your case, Kale, because you are very strong and you're in great shape. If you ever did factor in a martial art and you could do that and maintain your gym routine, yeah, that would be the best of both worlds. Right. Yeah. That's something that I'll work on getting to one of these days here, but uh, no, I think it's, I think it's important whether, uh, again, whether it's the gym or BJJ or some other type of martial arts, that physical activity is extremely important and uh, there's for different reasons, but for you, what is it that Brazilian Jiu Jitsu offers or how does that help you maintain just overall health in your life? So basically before I was doing Jiu Jitsu. I would finish the day <clears throat> mentally tired, but not necessarily physically tired. Right. So I wouldn't sleep as well, but now that I'm doing this physical activity, and it was the same thing when I was working out. When I was working out on the gym, I would feel finish the day physically tired and mentally tired, and so I would sleep better. But with jujitsu, for example, I finish the day and I am physically tired as well. And so I sleep better with it. It helps me handle stress better because I'm put in a lot of physically uncomfortable situations, a lot of times not being able to breathe. So it helps you to relax and control your breath and realize that I don't need to breathe like I think I do. As long as I can keep breathing, I'll be fine. And it'll, it, get, it teaches you patience, which I've enjoyed. It teaches you how to take opportunity on the mat. So it helps me also in life, take opportunities, take risks. I feel more, I feel like I'm more able to take risks with it in my business career because I guess like it builds you confidence in, in, Hey, I, if I go in a bad situation in my business, for example, I can work my way out of it the same way I do on the mat. I know it's not one for one, but it's just, it builds you that confidence there. I also like it because at my age, it's a great way to keep myself flexible, keep my joints and my back strong. There are guys in their 40s who don't work out at all. And that's what this podcast is recommending is some physical activity. But there are men who are in their early 40s. They try to move a dishwasher or an L pull their back. Right. I haven't pulled a back muscle and it's doing BJJ just because you're constantly tugging and pulling and twisting on all these little support muscles in your body. The same thing when you deadlift or squat, right? You're constantly using these muscles and joints. And so you're not, your body's a lot more resistant to injury in the real world because you're putting it under stress in a controlled environment. So that's why I like it for that as well. And also it's a challenge. It's very humbling to do BJ because you may think you're going to do something when you can't. And, and it's something where you, and when you do start getting better or learn a position or learn an escape, it's very rewarding. Same thing when you're working out in the gym, 
when you reach a certain level or get a certain rep or add a certain plate, it's that great feeling. Same thing with BJJ. So for me, like physical activity, I have to have it. If I don't do it, I definitely can feel it. Right. Yeah. And I like how you brought it in or you tied in that the bells or influences that it has in the business, because again, as we get more and more into our podcast here and get more and more guests and episodes, one of the things that we want to exhibit is that all three of these areas are interlinked, right? Every, what you do in your physical realm is going to affect things in your business or in, in your faith realm. And what you do in your faith realm is going to affect things, your physical and your business. So that's why we advocate this holistic approach to life, not just focusing on specifically one of these areas. Another thing that for me, at least, that I'm sure there's, I'm sure there's some science or whatever to back it up, but I just know from my experience is that physical fitness, it combats aging too, right? If you ever see, there's these examples of these 70 or 80 year old or even older on runners or bodybuilders even, and you look at them and you're like, oh my gosh, there's no way that they're that old, right? Or that people can do that at that age. And then you hear that cliche age is just a number type thing, which I think really is true to some degree. If you maintain a healthy, and there's a difference between a healthy physical fitness and an unhealthy level of physical fitness, if you maintain a healthy physical fitness, it most certainly can combat aging. Not to sound not arrogant or whatever, but I think both of us, like we're almost 40, right? Look relatively young. And I know for me personally, I get that comment a lot. Like when I tell people my age, they're very surprised. Just recently I was on a, I was on a trip with my youngest son, a three-year-old. We did a, this, this three-week trip through Europe and part of it was on a cruise. And I remember I took him to a dinner one night at one of the restaurants on the ship and you had to have a reservation there. So I went up to the hostess and the reservation and I was holding my three-year-old in my arms and she's like, oh, are you, are you his brother? Hey, no, I'm not. But his mother, <laughs> see, that would have been a good comeback. Yeah. <laughs> but no, realistically, I get that comment a lot that I look young. Sure. I think it definitely can play a humongous aspect in making that age just a number of things. So I agree. To piggyback on you. Important. Yeah. To piggyback on this, I just literally recently planted a bunch of fruit trees on my property. And I guess the saying goes, the best time to plant a fruit tree is 10 years ago. <laughs> the second best time is today. Same thing, I look at it with physical fitness. These 80-year-olds who are running marathons did start training for a That's, marathon at 79. Yeah. And they may not have started when they were 15. They didn't even started in their 40s or 50s or even 60s. Yeah. The key is you can't look and say, okay, I can never do that. I can never do those things. That's, I'm already too old or my, my back hurts or my knees hurt. You can do something. And the body, God designed the body to adapt to a whole range of different scenarios. And yeah, to, to pick it back off of you, I would agree. Just the best day to start working out would be 10 years ago. The second best day is today. Do something. Yeah. And you'll notice the difference. Yeah. Actually, I'm glad you brought that up. That's, that, and that's a good way to, to segue off of this as well. But yeah. I think that's excellent advice because like you mentioned, a lot of these people that are a lot older, seventies, eighties, whatever, that are in great shape. You're right. A lot of them didn't start until they were very old and they had. Oftentimes, it, just like most people, it takes something drastic or tra tragic to drive a big change in your life, yes. your lifestyle, right? Yeah. And so that can drive some very positive things as well. But yeah, there, it's never too late to get started. And just like with any type of physical fitness routine or starting a business or things of that nature, anything that's hard is just by nature, right? You're going to want to not do it. Right. Because what we are creatures of comfort, so to speak. Right. So anything that's hard, we want to shy away from, but the most beneficial things often come from those things that are hard. So again, whether it's starting the business and overcoming those challenges that you're going to face in the beginning, especially, or starting a physical fitness routine where I know with weightlifting, especially even if you just take a week or two off and then you get back into it. Those first few weeks, it can feel like you got run over by a freight train, right? Yeah. Your body is so sore because your muscles are not used to that. They're not used to being torn and having to rebuild themselves like that. But once you get past that and you push through it, you begin to 
sometimes even welcome those pains and things like that because it means growth. And the same goes for business. Sometimes as you get into it, you begin to welcome the challenges because that gives you opportunity for new growth. That's very um, true. Good point. Yeah. It's never a better time than today to get started. With that, let's jump into the faith aspect. So you are a devout Christian and that's what we, that's what we focus on and advocate in this podcast as well. Why don't you give us a little bit of background on your faith journey? When did you become a Christian? How did you, how did you begin your journey? And when did you really, when did you, when did it really sink in and you give yourself your life over to Christ? Yeah. So I, I was raised in a church, in a believing home, and my parents had come to faith in their early twenties. And so that's all I ever knew growing up. But like most people who are raised in the church, the faith wasn't my own. I had head knowledge of a decent amount of scripture. In fact, I'd probably say I probably knew more about the Bible as a non-believing member of my parents' household. I say non-believing meaning someone who hasn't surrendered themselves to Christ, right? I believed he existed, but no different than a demon believes God exists or Jesus is the Lord. It's not like that doesn't save you. All right. It wasn't personal. Dear. It wasn't personal. I hadn't submitted. And I knew decent, I knew enough scripture to be dangerous, meaning I could twist things to justify in my head pretty much whatever I wanted to do. And uh, so it really didn't become personal to me, or I would say I wasn't effectually called. And you guys can look up what that term means if you want to. I wasn't effectually called until I was about, I don't know, so maybe 23. I was down in Venezuela on one of my you know, work travel trips. And I remember sitting at the top and it was a apartment complex that was converted into a long-term extended stay hotel for business people, whatnot. And I was on the top floor and I was sitting on the balcony looking over Caracas. And I, I got a phone call from my boss who told me that my apartment was broken into and it was basically cleaned out. Someone had noticed I was gone. And so they ended up, cause I was gone for like full time months at a time. And they had brought a moving truck and moved me out. Basically I lost everything that I had except for my car and motorcycle. Surprisingly, I was still there. And around the same time, my, my girlfriend at the time huh, was cheating on me. I didn't know this at the time, but I was suspect, sus suspecting you. So I was sitting on the balcony upstairs and I was waiting for my flight the next morning to come back to see what I still had left. And I was like, all right, Lord, if you are not that if you're real, but if you are involved, if you're involved in the day to day affairs of mankind, then I just, I need to know. I need to feel something. I need to just experience it. That was kind of short lived. I came back to Miami. That my stuff was gone, but it wasn't yet enough to break me. And so soon after that, it was confirmed. My girlfriend was cheating on me. And so that was a whole devastating experience. Uh, so now I lost most of my stuff. I didn't have insurance. My girlfriend cheated on me. I was distraught over that. And then soon after, I was told that my job was being eliminated because Lucent was being bought by Alcatel. And so my exciting traveling job career <laughs> was coming to an end. And so I pretty much lost the three legs that had given me a false sense of security on my three-legged stool. And so I just broke down and I was like, all right, Lord, like now I'm ready. Now I'm ready to, to get to know you. I'm ready. I'm ready to actually learn about who you are. And it was at that time that I began to read the Bible. I was like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to read the Bible cover to cover just as a historical document. That's all I'm going to do. Because up to that point, I was like, it's written by men, holy men, but men. They put their biases in it. It's culturally irrelevant, a lot of parts and whatever. I, so I really didn't know what the Bible said apart from Bible stories. So I began reading and soon after I began reading, I got laid off. It actually happened. Got the job in California before it went into effect. So it actually was ended up being a blessing and moved to California, kept reading. I didn't finish reading Revelation. So finished the whole Bible until I had moved back to North Carolina. So it took me about two years, three years from the moment that I began reading, which is right before I left Miami to three years later when I came back to North Carolina. And that is what really began my journey. At that point, God, Jesus became my, 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 my master. 
right? I became his servant or biblically speaking, I became his slave. And, um, Christ is a phenomenal master, right? He's someone who expects and demands from you, but he gives you so much more. And so that's really what began my journey. I began reading scripture and reading, reading books on theology. I got in really big into apologetics, try to understand how does science verify biblical claims, the scientific claims that supposedly contradict scripture. Where are those? What are those based on? Are those based on assumptions or objective reality? What about the contradictions, quote unquote, in scripture between certain verses or passages? How do those work out? And, and it, it was amazing. The more I try to disprove scripture, not because I was being antagonistic, but because I wanted to play devil's advocate, the more I tried to disprove biblical claims or scripture, I would find that, that there was more than sufficient evidence to, mm -hmm. to back it up. And so then I realized for okay. apologetics, if you don't want there to be a God, if you don't want Christianity to be true, there is nothing that will convince you otherwise. So then I realized that it's really a hard issue that apologetics are great. It's great to strengthen your faith, which it did for my, for me. It's great for demolishing faulty arguments. So let's say, I, let's say I'm on an airplane with somebody and we get into a, a friendly discussion about God and they start throwing at me stuff. If I can refute what they're saying through apologetics, it probably will have no impact on them. But there are people around me who will hear this debate. And then that may spark in them a desire to look into an issue. So you know, I found that you know, was important. But I just realized that at the end of the day, if you don't want Christianity to be true or Christ to be your savior, there's no convincing. Christ himself, when he walked the earth, he raised Lazarus from the dead. People in the crowd witnessed it. Instead of falling on their face, they ran to find out how they could kill him. <laughs> and Lazarus. The Bible said they wanted to kill Lazarus too. All right. He didn't do anything but come back alive. So for me, anyways, that, that's my point is that faith became personal for me at the age of 23. And my sanctification process began then. I'm very far from where I should be. But I've been a believer now for 17 years and uh, I'm grateful for it. And it's, it's had a huge impact on how I run my business because I literally go to God and ask him for wisdom before making big decisions. I should go to him for every decision, right? But for the big ones, I go to him and I say, Lord, give me right. wisdom on how to do this. Help me to glorify you in whatever I do. Help me not to act rashly or make a mistake that'll hurt my family. And his response to that always has been to answer my prayers. And what I mean by that is I have made decisions that have led to difficult results. So I'm not saying that I have a genie in the sky who gives me the answer to everything. But every single time I had have made a decision that wasn't optimal in my mind, and it's always led to a deeper understanding of who he is, to a refining of my business acumen, and ultimately has been for the good of the business or my family. And so now I have a lot more confidence when I pray that the answer I receive or the guidance I get, it may not always be the easy path, what I want, but it's the necessary path. And so I actually enjoy involving God in my business on the day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. And there, so there's a lot in there and I want to, I want to touch on a couple things you said. So you mentioned that in your journey, it took really a breaking down of you to ultimately accept Christ. Right. Uh, and I think a lot of people have that experience. I know it was similar for me in a lot of the books in the Bible, similar stories as well, even with some of the apostles. And so there is this breaking down that's often necessary or refinement. And I think of, I oftentimes think of the story of Joseph and just the nightmare life that he went through yeah, for yeah. so long before he was redeemed, so to speak, and vindicated is a better word. Yeah. And becoming the ruler of Egypt and ultimately seeing what the fruits of that suffering and refinement was for. And I think for many of us, myself certainly included, it's very hard to see or think long-term, not only with things of faith, but any type of struggle you have, whether it's financial, business, whatever, 
very hard to think long term because you're stuck in that suffering in the moment, right? Yeah. And so I go back to that story of Joseph and think, okay, he's sold as a slave by his own family, right? Or actually they intended to kill him. Yeah. <laughs> so then he's sold as a slave, taken as a youth to a strange land. Then he gets put in prison. Yeah. Falsely accused. Falsely accused. He gets forgotten about when he interprets the dreams and asks for them to put in a good word with Pharaoh. He gets forgotten about for, what, I think it was three years before it, it came up again. Which I think brings his total time in prison to 16 years. Right. Yeah. So this whole oh thing was like 20 some odd years of his suffering and refinement to ultimately come to his vindication. But you look at his response to everything during that suffering. Not once was it a cursing or blaspheming of God. Now, of course, we don't have every single thing that happened throughout those years, but, and what's recounted to us, we don't see this complaining or wallowing and woe is me. We see him striving to do his best in whatever situation he was presented with, no matter how difficult it was and not getting stuck in that, that here and now, and there's no end in sight. There's no light at the end of the tunnel. And so I think for a lot of us, like I said, myself included, it's so hard to do that. And so when you're presented with these challenges or these sufferings to think that at the end of the day, even if it, even if that suffering continues through all of your mortal life on this yeah. earth, it is temporary, right? Yep. Because for us, the, whatever it is, 70, 80, 90, maybe a hundred years that we may live on this mortal shell on this earth, that seems like an eternity for us because we can't really we don't have enough perspective to understand what eternity truly is after this mortal life. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so it's very, it's very difficult. And I guess where I'm going with that is just, that's where we need to ultimately go back to the word and look at these examples of heroes of the faith and try to model ourselves after that and try to address our problems, our, our sufferings as they have, or as Christ shows us to. hundred percent. Like what you're saying, a quick comment on that. So you mentioned like this kind of breaking down seems to be a common theme. And it's true because the, one of the biggest barriers, first of all, the root of sin is pride. You go back right. to the garden, you go back to the first sin with Lucifer, right? It was always pride. Pride is always the root of sin. And, and so human beings are prone to pride. And you're going to have to be broken down. Some people have more pride than others. And so some will have a greater fall than others. But be grateful for the process. Be grateful for it. And something else, if God has ordained to grant somebody, to grant you, our listener, or even our, each other, the, the blessing of a successful business, passive income, real estate, hospitality, whatever it is, if God's blessed you with that and you're one of his children, that comes with a price tag because he's not going to give you something that's going to add pride to your life and make you even hard, more hard-hearted towards him. If he's going to give you the blessing that comes with success financially or whatever, you're going to have to be refined. You're going to have to be put in the furnace and you're going to have to have the dross brought to the surface. And the scripture says this, that uh, no one likes being in the furnace. Nobody enjoys it, but the refining process it's a life, lifelong experience. And every single time we're put in the furnace is natural for us to say, I want out. Let me out. Let me out. But what we should say, and I say should mean, I don't always do this. We should say, Lord, don't let me out. Let this be effective for you. Let this experience bring the dross that you intend to get out of my life, out of my life. Because that's how you get out of the furnace. You don't get out of the furnace by begging to get out. You get out of the furnace when the metalsmith sees that the dross he intends to remove has been removed. And you don't remove it all at once anyways. You put it in, you bring it out, you scrape off the slag or whatever it is, you put it back in again, and you do that to the degree that you want that metal to be what you want it to be. And everyone has a different path. And I think if you're going to be successful in business and honor and glorify Christ, who gave you that, that talent or that ability, you have to be prepared for the furnace. And when you're put in it, you have to develop the discipline to endure it and 
find out why am I here? What can I do to be more like you? And sometimes we're put in furnaces, not even for us. Sometimes it's for our spouse or for our kids or for a, a business partner to observe how we handle the stress. In fact, in my own life, I'll make a quick comment. My business partners, um, uh, who are, who were the friends of my parents, they entered this relationship as atheists, both of them. And because of what we've been through, and we've been through a lot, that could be a whole other podcast, what we've been through as in, in this business. And they've said, and I don't mean this to brag, I brag in the Lord. They said that witnessing how you, Wes, have handled these things and how your family handles these things has inspired us to open our hearts towards the gospel. And my business partner, the wife, she's reading the Bible now on the regular to her husband. Her husband's asking questions about it. And I'm not going to speak for their spiritual state, but this is a dramatic improvement. So if what I've been through, which is a whole other story, has been just for their sake, just to give them somebody to watch, to draw them to Christ, worth it a hundred percent. But I know it wasn't just for that because God's the ultimate multitasker. So he's doing things in my life, same time he's doing things in their life. But yeah, that's my little side note. Yeah, I think that's a great point. So th to dig in a little bit as to how your faith influences your handling of financial and business decisions, you know, what you were talking about there, what are some practical things that people can do to start a discipline I think of how I'm trying to say this. So the love of money is the root of all evil. So as you become more successful in life, especially in the financial arena, it can have the effect of amplifying your sinful nature, right? And money and finances is where one of the biggest struggles is. So what do you do? What do you do to surrender your finances to God's will? And are there any practical things that you can think of that people you would recommend people get started on even before maybe they've reached financial independence or financial success that can help them to do that discipline once they do become successful? So I would say one of the first things you have to, the first mindset you need to have is of a steward. Okay. And I'll give an example. So I deposit my money into my bank, right? The money belongs to me. It's in the bank. If I call the bank or a broker and I say, do something with my money, that, that bank or broker must obey me. If they don't obey what I say, I'm pulling my money out. Now, while the money's in their care, they're able to draw a percentage off of it. They can earn income off of it because that's their, they're the steward. But if they're an unfaithful steward, why would I leave my money with that bank or that broker? It's the same thing with God. The assets we own really are God's. He gives us temporary stewardship over them, and we're able to make a living through them, which is reasonable. However, we have to be willing to do with those assets what God commands. And sometimes God's command could just be a tug on your heart for a cause, for a ministry, for a person in need, whatever it may be. And so for me, one of the things that I ask the Lord on the regular for is, Lord, help me to keep a light grip on whatever you give me so that if you give me something, I can enjoy it, but I'm never clinging onto it so tightly that when you go to move it somewhere else to maybe another steward or wherever that I am refusing to let go. Because the moment I start holding on to what he's given me and not allowing it to be used for his purposes, why would I expect him to continue blessing me financially? So practically, what I would say is start supporting some ministries. It doesn't need to be much. Just start supporting some ministries. And you could say, I don't really know which ones to support. Some of them corrupt and whatnot. Sure, some are corrupt, but I'll speak to that in a second. First of all, there is a, I forgot what it's called. It's like an evangelical charity ranking. It's like, right. It's like a rating system. Right? Yes. 
So you can actually go to their website, you can Google it, and they'll actually list everybody that they've done actual financial analysis on to show you like what percentage of their donations they receive goes to the actual charity. Because you have plenty of secular organizations where 97% of all their funds go to overhead and 3% goes to the actual cause. So you can see that for ministries. But I'll say more important than that is find a cause that's important to you that God puts on your heart. I remember one time I was listening to a Christian radio station and they ha- and the, the, the person had a little, had a guest from, and I'll just say this for me, for India Partners. India Partners is a Christian organization over in India and they raise funds to help children who are born in red light districts who, if they weren't helped otherwise, would grow up to become prostitutes themselves. And it's a life of absolute misery. And so what they do is they go into these districts and they gather up these children and put them in day schools where they're not sitting around next to their mom in the next room who's being sexually abused. They're learning to read and to write. They teach them how to sew and do things to actually earn income. And while they're doing this, they're preaching the gospel to them. They're feeding them. It's an amazing thing. So I heard this story on this Christian radio program and I was like, you know what? I felt personal conviction to support them. And so I do. And not everyone will be called to do that because there are many ministries out there that are the hands and feet of Christ. But I would say if you've been blessed by God financially with any type of business that that is generating income, just don't just wait, but actively be pursuing ways to sow financially into ministries. Because here's the thing. Some people God calls to go be a missionary in India, right? That's their calling. And they're never going to personally make the amount of money that you may make as someone who's God's given the ability to draw resources. But if you partner together, your conduit, your stewardship of resources with those who have been called to a life of, let's say, poverty while they serve overseas or wherever, what a beautiful partnership. They, here's the thing, there's something else I think I, I have to remind myself. In the scheme of things, in eternity, which you said earlier, we really can't comprehend. In eternity, they are building up massive amounts of wealth. Whatever that currency is, they are on it. If we have been blessed with gold, silver, dollar bills, crypto, whatever, in this life, that stuff has zero value for eternity. So we may be wealthy for 70 years, but I would rather not be in poverty for eternity. So the best way to prevent that is to say, Lord, let me partner with people who are building up treasure and let me join them in that investment. Because when you support someone financially or a ministry or whatever, whether it be across town or overseas, when you do that as a believer, what you're doing is you're literally doing a currency exchange. You're exchanging moth-ridden dollar bills or whatever the currency in heaven is going to be. And you're partnering with those over there, enabling their ministry. And it's a beautiful thing. So I would say that is one of the things I would try to do is just find out, first of all, have the mindset that you're a steward. You own nothing. And the second, I'll say, okay, Lord, where can I steward this money? It doesn't mean you have to give it all away. That's not what he's saying. It doesn't mean you can't have a nice life or a nice car or a nice house, but you can't hold on to it with a tight fist. Yeah. And that... <laughs> That is a big struggle, I think, for most of us. Me too. And that's where going back a little bit to what I was saying on starting disciplines or practices, even before you become more financially successful, I think is crucial because uh, just for example, when it comes to tithing, I do set aside 10% of my income. And I started that when I was a new believer. And I remember I was making around, and this is before taxes around $30,000. I just graduated college. I was working as a commercial real estate agent in the midst of the Great Recession. Oh, great timing. Great timing. Exactly. Yeah. I remember my first year I made, it was around $30,000 in commissions. And then of course you pay taxes off of that. And I was setting aside the 10%, you know, $3,000 or so, whatever it was from that. And I remember having a conversation with a friend at dinner one night, asking me why the heck I was doing that. I was making so little money first place. Why even make it harder? And looking back at it now, though, I'm very grateful that I've, I started that discipline because 
now that I have reached some level of financial success, I've set up the systems to make it somewhat easier to maintain that. And I'll get into that a little bit more of what I do when we do the interview, my interview, but setting up those systems and disciplines when you have maybe little is going to make it a lot easier to do that when you have more, if that makes sense. hundred percent. And not only is it easier, biblically it's necessary, right? Bible says, if you're not trust, if you're not trustworthy with a little, you won't be with a lot. And a lot of times I look at my own life the same way. When you are making not very much and you're faithful, you'll be surprised at what God does in your life. But I think the key here, like you were saying, Kale, the key is to be disciplined about it and to recognize that what, wh whether I put $10,000 with this broker or a hundred thousand dollars of the broker, that broker is obligated to do what I say with that money. The $10,000 broker can't say, Hey, I'm only getting 10 grand off this guy. This is nothing. He didn't give me a hundred grand like the other guy got. So I'm going to do whatever I want with this money. Then I'm going to pull the $10,000 away and give it to the hundred thousand dollar guy. And you can see that actually in scripture. So I think like you said, hundred percent, you need to be faithful with a little. And if you're not, you will be with a lot. You can be greedy. And poor and greedy and rich. Yeah. That's not going to change. Yeah, absolutely. Great. So this has been awesome. Got some really great insights in all these areas. So to try to wrap it up here and tie some things together, we have some questions that we'd like to ask all our guests the same thing. So what would you tell your 20-year-old self if you had the chance? Oh, man. I would tell my 20-year-old self that you are not the exception for all the conventional wisdom that's out there. And I would tell myself to save more and, and be patient. Be patient because I was not a patient person. And Kale, you would know this because we were roommates. Yeah, that's great. Do you have any current goals in any of these areas that we or your, our audience could help you with? I have two goals and I guess the audience can help me through prayer, really, because my first goal is I would like to be more motivated with my fitness. I want to add in working out again to my routine. And I intended to start that in January and it's now almost April and I haven't started it yet. So I would need motivation there. And then the second thing is my other goal is I'm, I want to open a another location down in Florida and I'm having a hard time dealing with this interest rates and material costs justifying the expense of building out right now. And so my goal has actually shrunk a little bit to lease some retail space and open up a daycare center slash grooming salon to get some brand recognition and some additional income stream that I can use hopefully down the line. So I would say prayers would be coveted. And the prayer I would request is that God just grant me wisdom to do, to do the right thing with the resources he's given me. And that God would give me some motivation to get off my butt and get in the garage and work out. <laughs> Very good. So if any of our listeners have any resources in Florida or know of some contractors or yeah, retail or space available in Lake Lake. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. So you can reach out. And the last, what are you reading currently? And do you have a must read book that has had a large impact on your life? Oh man. Okay. The, a must read book I would say would be the serpent of paradise. That is, that's a book and hopefully I'm quoting this correctly. That is one of the books that just rocked my world theologically. The book is basically about how Satan is actually God's devil, if that makes any sense. Right. That as Satan is not autonomous, that he is not God's equal. It's not a classic yin yang situation. Right. That Satan is in rebellion against God, but everything Satan does ultimately moves God's plan of redemption forward. Perfect example of that would be Christ being crucified. Scripture even says, had they known that Christ being crucified would have done what it did. They would have never done it. 
Right. And so when I read that book, my eyes were just opened to the beauty of the sovereignty of God, his power and majesty, and how even the trials I go through are a hundred percent for my good and for his glory. And then what I'm reading currently right now, I'm embarrassed to say nothing. I usually read on the regular, but I have taken the past probably two and a half months of all my free time going towards renovating my landscaping. So I have dirt under my fingernails and cuts on my hands. Well, I would say nothing right now, but, but I definitely read a lot. And that book would be one I'd recommend. Great. I'm going to check that out. Yeah. I haven't heard of that before. Awesome. Wes, it's been a lot of great information here. And so how can people get in touch with you? So I am actually not on social media just because it's not good for me, but you can reach me at my email, which is w.whitehead at me.com. That's me.com. Feel free to reach out with any questions you have about the pet industry, pet hospitality, if you're curious about it, how maybe it might relate to real estate investment. I can point you in the direction of some market research that I've come across that's helped me make some decisions. If you have any questions about book recommendations, I've got that as well. Or if you're ever in the Lakeland area, shoot me an email. I'm always down to have coffee or breakfast with somebody to talk to dog business. So Lakeland, Florida. We'll roll on the mat and get sweaty with you. Or roll on the mat and get sweaty with me. And depending on how long you've been doing, BJ, to either whoop my butt or let me show you some things I've learned. There we go. Awesome. Thank you again, Wes. And we'll see you guys on our next episode.